Thank you very much. Um, welcome everybody to our very own sauna here. Um, bear with me for this second last question of the day, which is about a kind of important topic. It's about the kind of holy grail of app developers because it's about revenues. And if it's about revenues, it's about money that will make your business grow. So we do the good old hands up game one more time just to keep you a bit moving after the break. Hands up if you optimize and measure lifetime value already. That's not just like 20%, maybe. Out of those who, keep your hands up. Out of those who measure and optimize lifetime value already, how many of you would, do, you do it, would say you do it really well and you wouldn't change a thing if you could? Wow, okay, I think we haven't had that in London or Paris. So that's 0% of the audience, which in turn means the presentation is highly relevant. So that's good. Um, lifetime value in the apps world. It's quite a heavy topic, especially in the late afternoon hours. We're going to try to get it to you with this structure. First of all, a little bit like in driving school, we're going to go into the theoretical foundations of lifetime value modeling and of predictive analysis. And secondly, we're going to go into a bit more practical perspective, applying your theoretical knowledge and going into best practices that you can actually use in your own businesses. Now let's start directly with the first part. Predictive analysis is the underlying theory that helps you answer any kind of question you ask yourself about the future of your business. It helps you answer any kind of, or to prove any kind of hypothesis, right or wrong. So predictive analysis is really a theory. Lifetime value is a part of this theory, but by far not the only one. Now, it enables you to forecast users' behavior. And as you can see on the slide here, this woman seems to have a retail shop. So she's asking herself, what products should I put in my shop? Like, where should I put the products in my shop? How many products should I put, should I put in my shop? How frequent will users or buyers come to my shop and purchase goods? What's the cost of acquiring customers to my shop? And what's the lifetime value of my, product in my, uh, of my users in my shop? Now, for predictive analysis, there are very simple models that you can apply to answer those business critical questions, and they're very complex ones. Simple models could really be, let's say you have a social app and you're asking a specialist to give you an analysis of how much revenue you could actually make using ad monetization. That's fairly simple, and it helps you understand that question, right? Or to give the answer to that question. There are also extremely complex models, um, some of which are really higher maths, so I'm not going to go in depth into those, but be aware that some, some structures like Pareto, net binomial value, and so on, could be important here if you want to read up on that. Please feel free to do so. To run predictive analysis, who would have thought so? We need data, right? And if we want data, we need tools. So if you want to answer those, if, if you want to answer those business questions, you have to be able to put the right data in, right? There are three things to remember here. First of all, choose the right metrics. Com comes kind of obvious. Typical metrics would be engagement data, retention data, like Nico and Maxime talked about before. Number of active users you might be expecting, frequency of visits, recency of the last purchase or the last visit, and so on and so forth. Make sure that you put the variables that answer the question. Secondly, the importance of those variables that you're feeding into the data models actually depends on, a several, on several questions. First of all, type of the app. If you're a social app, you care about engagement, right? Whereas if you're a real estate app, you assume that engagement is kind of cyclical, so users will only look for apartments or houses in a very, in a, like, very few months of a year or of a decade. <laughs> Lastly, depending on the analytical model that you're actually using, importance varies as well. So if you're using a very complex mathematical model, you will need a lot more data than if you're using a simple one. Also, the treatment of data and the uh, ability of your tool to process it is highly important. So it has to be able to import data quickly, it has to be able to cluster it according to the question or the hypothesis you're feeding in, and it has to be able to treat the data quickly and give the output to you as soon as you need it. So that's data. Predictive analysis, however, doesn't only depend on uh, the data you have from your analytical tools. It also depends on some contextual factors. One example being 
do you have a contractual or a non-contractual relationship to your user? A contractual relationship could be your electricity bill, right? Or it could be a subscription in a news app. That's a contractual relationship. It gives you already the lifetime of how long will you get your fees or your, the money you charge from the user. Whereas a non-contractual, the user can just bounce or churn whenever he or she wants to. Stop playing a game, stop buying your retail app, and so on. So this factor will obviously influence the predictive analysis as soon as you're talking about, for instance, revenues. Also, predictive analysis will be influenced by the stage in which you're in. So if you're a startup and you're very new to the market, you have to persuade a lot of people that your startup is actually a good idea. Investors, stakeholders, your users, and so on. So you might make more aggressive assumptions. That will reflect in your predictive analysis model. If you're a mature business, you've been around for a couple of years, you know your market, you know your users, you will take more conservative assumptions. That also influences. Now, like I said in the beginning, predictive analysis, that's just a theory because it underlies lifetime value. It's the theory on which it is built. Why are we talking about lifetime value? Why are we giving 45 minutes of our time to lifetime value? And why is it the last session of the day? Well, because it's really important. So, that's why you need to give me your last bit of attention that you're having. Lifetime value makes you understand the value that users have for you. It makes you understand what revenue you will generate in the future. It makes you understand which channels are the right channels to invest in, where should you put your resources, and what's actually going to be the outcome, what's going to be the dividend for yourself or for your investors. It can answer you a whole lot of questions when asking those, uh, sorry, when asking those questions, it can give you a whole lot of answers. A popular example is many newspaper apps ask me, should we invest in mobile web or should we invest in apps? Well, essentially, you should think about lifetime value. It will help you. It's one of the metrics, but it's a good one to look at. If you calculate lifetime value, there are some pitfalls, and I want to point them out before we actually go into the maths itself. First of all, make sure your growth strategy is not just focused on maximizing lifetime value. Like I said, it's one metric but it should be rather an effect than a cause, right? So lifetime value, if it increases, it should be the result of actions that you take on your product, on your marketing strategy, in your communication strategy, and so on and so forth. Lifetime value should also not be your competitive advantage. So if you have, let's assume you have a lifetime value of 50, uh, sorry, of $100, and your competitor, why, why ever you know that, has $50, don't get lazy on that because it's a temporary snapshot. So if you get lazy on the higher lifetime value and you, get, and you don't continue to develop for your users, you, this might have bad repercussions. A second point is, a too optimistic lifetime value would lead you to an excess in investment. And we all know what it means. That means you go into the red numbers. Remember, lifetime value is based on assumptions. So assumptions can be wrong. And so lifetime value shouldn't be the only criteria, and you should look into different scenarios and how to calculate it, conservative versus aggressive. Let's make an example of cost of acquiring customers. In theory, the cost of acquiring customers could be as, uh, equal to lifetime value. Right? If it's higher, you're in the red numbers, which is a bad sign. Only very few investors actually allow that, if it's your growth strategy. Um, a rule of thumb that was told to us is 30 to 40% of your lifetime value should be the maximum that you spend on customer acquisition costs. Now we get to the calculation later and there are some other things to, to, um, to look out for, but that's the basic assumption, that's the rule of thumb. Right, maths. So, the formula you see here is the basis of every other lifetime value formula you're going to find around, right? Lifetime value depends on engagement, retention, monetization. I think it was Maxime who had that on his slides as well. So uh, he took my message away, but it's true. It depends on those three variables. Lifetime value for a certain period equals lifetime times average revenues per user. Right? Sounds fairly simple. Now let's look at the, into the different variables. First, the lifetime value period. So the lifetime value you're gonna, going to get out of your equations will heavily depend on the time frame for which you calculate it. A user that has a certain lifetime value for 180 days LTV calculation will have a very different value for a 365-day lifetime period calculation. 
what factors influence your lifetime um, period decision? Sorry, I'm going to say LTV because I'm really too lazy to say lifetime value every time. So what factors influence this? First of all, the business nature. Is your app, is your business nature long or is it short circle? Is it an Olympic Games app, which is relevant for a couple of months, or is it a software as a service business, which users might be using for years and years? Secondly, business model. Advertising, non-contractual business model. Subscriptions, contractual business model. You'll choose a different life horizon or period. And stage of company, again, will influence that. So startups tend to make aggressive assumptions, so they go for a longer life, life cycle. Com um, mature businesses would go for a shorter one. La Matinal, on this example, has an average lifetime of their subscriptions of 15 months. So that's the lifetime variable, not the period. However, they decide to calculate the period for one and for two years. Why do they do that? Because they want to see how the numbers change between those two models, right? They funnel it together, they look at the aggregate, and they take decisions based on the two isolated to each other. That's for them to understand how it actually differs. That's a nice example here. Lifetime calculation. Now, this curve, the retention, the survival curve. So for lifetime, retention is critical, right? Because it essentially tells you the opportunities that you have to convert a user into a paying user. So lifetime is also highly correlated to engagement, because the more engaged the user is, the more likely he is to, re to be retained, the more lifetime he will have. Again, there are very, very different ways of calculating lifetime, some very simple ones and some very complex ones. We heard that before, I know. Um, first, with a simple model, for instance, you would define a moment of churn. When is churn actually happening for you? Let's say you say, if a user is two weeks inactive, he's churned. That's my definition of it. Let's say you look at your curves, and you find out, well, on average, after six months, that's when users are getting inactive. Hence, that's my, that's my churn. Hence, that's my, active, uh, that's my average lifetime. Now, there are also very complex ones, which are based on those survival curves. We're going to get to that later, I promise. Lastly, our monetization metric, where prices come in, average revenue per user. Now, that's typically not that difficult to determine, because it's usually total monthly revenues divided by monthly active users, giving you the average revenues per month. Make sure that you're, doing, that you're taking the right units. So you should have the same units then when you do the lifetime calculation. Right, now that's the, basic, that's the basic calculation of it. Now, you might ask, sorry, I have to drink in between because otherwise <laughs> I can't bear it. Um, you might ask yourself, what's cost? What about cost? Many developers, in fact, don't only look at revenues. They do look at costs as well. Because in real life, you want to know how your net lifetime value actually looks like. So what you would do is, typical top-down method, you take the revenue you earned, you deduct all variable costs, and you get into variable contribution, right? So be aware that variable contribution can vary for different user segments, and that's something also to look at. Obviously, the more user segments you define, and for the more user segments you make this analysis, the more tricky it will be in the end to calculate your lifetime value, but it's worth it. Also, you might ask yourself, well, if I am a very long cycle app, how how should I do it with future revenues that occur far out in the, in the future? That's when the discount rate comes in. So like some of you might have learned in investment calculations, you discount future cash flows into net present value. So that's very important because if you think about the example, if you have 10 euros today, those 10 euros won't buy you the same amount of goods in five years, right? Inflation. So that's something to take into consideration here because your investments today will be impacted by those revenues tomorrow. In the best case scenario, they will be refinanced. So that's something to take into account as well. Right, so that's it for the theory. Like I said in the introduction, um, we will take the theory first and we will then apply it into practice. Now, as you see, I'm a passionate motorbiker. You can see that here. I'm a very passionate motorbiker. And together with some of my biker pals, we came up with the idea to develop an app specifically for motorbikers. Right? We want to showcase the nicest routes across Europe, the nicest hotels, the best places to drink your non-alcoholic beers with your biker pals. So 
we came up with this app idea, and we're bootstrapping this app. Hence, we want to know what's going to happen with our investment and how can we refinance it, and where should we invest it. So in order to determine which monetization model we choose, we talked to some contacts we have across the industry, and um, we wanted to figure out how they do it with their LTV calculations. First of all, we found that it's essentially four pure business models and many hybrid business models prevailing in the industry. You have premium apps, you have subscriptions, you have in-app purchases, so freemium, you have ads, and you have hybrid models. In reality, hybrid models are the most common ones in the industry. Let's start with premium. The good news is premium is the easiest to calculate lifetime value because your LTV essentially equals the price. Now, your user acquisition costs also tend to be very accurately calculated because you can just base it on the LTV you're having or best case scenario on the net LTV you're saying. Now, that being said, that is a priori. It means usually you will have hybrid models, especially with premium, right? We talked to some contacts at Camaringo and they're one of, the, one of the most popular photography apps in, in, in play. So they're having, a, they're having a premium business model and they told us that the price is the key for them and the price has to be right. You have to be able to offer the user the exact price point he's, he or she is willing to buy. So they're doing loads of testing around these two pounds 99 um, using price elasticity testing methods, using indices like the Big Mac index or certain, certain purchasing power indexes in order to set the right price. Also, for Camaringo, when it comes to maximizing lifetime value, they're looking into two main things, store ratings and reviews and store listing. We heard a lot about those topics already today, but this actually confirms it. If the moment of truth, truth comes and the user is supposed to buy in your app before he's ever seen it or seen anything than maybe a promotional video or screenshots, you have to have good ratings, even more than in on any other model. And you have to have reviews that give direct feedback, that's a bit blurry, the best camera app out there, period. I've tried them all, go ahead, buy it. You'll like it. So they need those kind of reviews because that's the word of mouth that you need. So what are they doing to optimize it? First of all, they are super proactive with customer service. It goes without saying, they're responding to, ba to bad reviews. They're also responding to good reviews, but they're actually, they're actually actioning it. That's tricky. So that means whenever they get feedback, it's real feedback, so they worked on it. And whenever they get praise, they ask the guy to, to, to keep up with his engagement. Also, they're trying to maximize the ratings. So what they're doing is the typical user prompt, but they don't just prompt the user whenever. They look at loyal users that they prompt first. They look at prompting them only when they have good network coverage so that they can actually fill it out. They have a nice mechanism in the, in the message that the user, if it doesn't want to be bothered, can just click don't bother me again. And they will try everything not to annoy the user because nothing is worse than being prompted the entire time and then you're like, okay, screw that, I'm going to give you a one star, right? So that's very, that's very important. Also, their store listing. They would never use human trans, uh, sorry, they would never use bot translators or Google Translate. They would always use humans. Because in the end, that has to be natural, right? Store listing experiments is key ingredient. Fergus talked to it beforehand, talked about it beforehand. Um, according to Camaringo, actually, the first time they optimized this entire funnel, or this part of the funnel, it led to a 25% increase in downloads. Well, that's very interesting. Now, we learned about premium. The next thing we wanted to, the next business model we wanted to look at was the subscription business. We were, because we wanted to take away this pay without having seen it, right? And wanted to increase maybe installs. So we looked at subscriptions. Now, a good, a good friend of mine explained me the following. In subscriptions, the ARPU is fairly straightforward because it's fixed, right? You're having your monthly, your quarterly, your annual subscription and the rate is fixed, so you know that beforehand. The LTV in subscriptions is really driven by lifetime, which is equal to the average subscription rate. That again depends on the renewal rates that you're having at the end of the term, and that again depends on churn, right? Is everybody, I hope everybody's following me. So churn rates and renewal rates are crucial. That's why lifetime here in this example is one divided by churn ratio. So this change, right, and it's very concrete. You have to have your, ra your churn ratio, which is the opposite of your renewal rates. 
Now, our poo is fixed. Lifetime is one divided by turn ratio. What about the lifetime value period? Now, usually the lifetime value period should be your average subscription length, right? Because you can't, you can't take this assumption a priori because you know what's the average length because you have this kind of contractual relationship. Now, in practice, many of the subscription-based um, developers or businesses would also calculate based on 180 days or 365 days, just like we've seen before in the example with La Matinale. Right, there are certain caveats to calculating lifetime value for subscription-based apps. First, exclude free trials, right? Those are not revenues, so exclude them. Second, exclude any form of promotion or introductory pricing that you might be doing, or at least take the revenue that you're actually going to get for, from it. Secondly, segment by cohorts. It's worth it to compare the different, the different lifetimes that you're actually having, so the quarterly subscription versus the annual, at least. Right? Thirdly, discount future cash flows. Because you're having a contractual business, your lifetime might be much longer, hence you need to discount the net present value. Fourth, cross-platform attribution. Now let's take the example of a newspaper app. Your business is across many platforms, right? So you have to be able to attribute for lifetime value across those platforms to compare it. So that means you should be measuring, in the best case scenario, with the same formula on mobile web, on apps, on desktop, what's the lifetime value of the monetization form that you're actually using, right? Take the formula, do it the percentage in terms of usage, and you get an average to have, that's like as a basis. So, Measurement in subscription app, LTV equals subscription fee times churn, which is subscription fee times one divided by churn. Right. There is an interesting paradox for subscription apps, and I'm not sure how many of you met it, and I'm not going to do a show of fans again. Um, it's the negative churn paradox. So let's assume my motorbike app only has two paying subscribers. One of them is Maxime, my colleague here, who's a biker as well, and the other is my girlfriend. Now, for whatever reason, Maxime decides after one year that he's not gonna prolong his subscription because he's sick and tired of motorbiking. So the only customer I have left is my girlfriend. Now, 50% of my revenue in theory is gone, and 50% of my users in theory are gone, right? However, I managed to upsell the super duper extraordinary VIP package to my girlfriend for $10 more than the actual subscription cost of Maxime was, right? I have 50% user churn, but I have no, but I have 110% of revenue. So that's the negative churn paradox. You upsell to the, to the users that are most, most engaged, that renew their subscriptions because you can offer them additional content that's worth it for them to pay for it. And that's what most successful software as a services or utilities apps are actually trying to do, upselling to the users that are core. Read up on that, it's, I think it's, fairly, it's a very interesting framework. Um, we're not gonna go deeper here, but read up on this. Drama Fever. I talked to a guy at Drama Fever, Korean, Korean um, TV series streaming app, right? And um, they analyze the, in very different cohorts when it comes to measuring their lifetime value. They're looking at, looking at user life, because for them it's really obvious that the longer, that it, there is a certain moment, like after one, two months of b having subscribed in the app, this user will stick around forever. So they build this loyalty fairly quickly. So they will look at this points of time when they define their cohorts, right? They will also look after, for instance, churn by payment methods. Visa debit, visa credit, bank, bank debit. This seems to have an impact on their, on their measurement. Think about it if it might have for yours. And they, annual, they, they analyze monthly and annual passes separately because they see a whole different lifetime value coming around there. Some other interesting points for Drama Fever. Churn rates are based on the last three months, so the average of the last three months. They don't take a very short-term metric, like one month, just because of data reliability and significance. And they don't take very long churn rates because they're changing the product continuously, so this will change as well. Secondly, they calculate net lifetime value because they want to know about cost. They apply a discount rate going to net present value because of the long cycle. They're, not tr they're trying not to spend more than 30 to 40% of their LTV 
on customer acquisition costs. So this kind of confirms everything that I was saying before, um, but it's interesting to see that being put in practice. Tactics that maximize lifetime value. Now, I think we've heard a lot about tactics to maximize engagement and retention already. They are essentially the same tactics that you would apply for LTV because it's depending on those variables. Now, for drama fever, interestingly, free trials had little to no impact. On the opposite, it actually sometimes had a negative impact because the user would download an app following a specific series. Now the season would run out of that series before the user actually ever had to pay for the app. So it backfired very often. Drama Fever also tries to make, to make their promotions really impactful. So they're offering very few promotions, but they're making sure that if they offer promotions, they're very good promotions and very appealing to the user. They offer multiple tiers. I think many subscription-based apps do that. Um, giving different, different levels of access and features to the different users and having different prices which they test for any user segment that they might observe. As I mentioned before, they're segmenting quite a lot. And two very important points, they're minimizing passive churn and they're trying to discourage active churn. Now passive churn is churn that users encounter because of some technical difficulty. Let's say your credit card is expired so you can't renew. Let's say you don't have sufficient funds in your bank account so you won't be renewing. So that's passive churn. They're trying to have really proactive customer service, realizing as soon as there is a complication and counteracting it. They're also trying to discourage active churn, which is users just choosing not to renew their subscriptions. How do they do that? They put special, they put special, special deals in front of the user whose subscription will run out in the next two weeks and try to get him back into the service. All right. Next up. Freemium. My pals and I were discussing and we said, hey, all of the games are kind of doing it. Maybe we should look into in-app purchases and making some of our content free and having the user pay for others. Now, freemium apps, LTV depends a lot of end user engagement, right? And we see again the survival curve here. When you talk about lifetime for freemium apps, you're taking a slightly different approach than with subscriptions. In the lifetime calculation for freemium apps, you're picking reference dates on this survival curve. You're picking one day, for instance, seven days, and 28 days. You're then looking, how does my historical data for various user cohorts, what data points do I get on those dates, on those reference dates? You will get out an equation which looks like the one up there, where t is the, is the day, and a, b, c are the coefficients. Now, you will see, you will have lots of various equations, so as the next step, you're trying to get out the <coughs> sorry, a cumulative deviation of those equations in order to get to an average. And that average would be your lifetime. Now, I mean, that sounds a little complex, but in the end, it makes sense, right? It's the accurate average of, of your lifetime here. Now, your ARPU, that will really be depending on the units you sold during a certain time, the price of the units you sold. So, the calculation is total average revenue in a period divided by the active users you have in, those in this period. Again, look at the same, the same time units, please. Lastly, the period usually is, be, is, is a standard. You're looking at 180 days or you're looking at 365 days. So it's fairly standard because in the end you're not having any kind of, you're having very flexible churn dates, most presumably, in your non-contractual business model. Right, so the formula, as we have it, is the one that we actually saw in the very beginning. LTV period equals lifetime times ARPU, okay? OkCupid okay, um, is one of the biggest dating apps in Google Play. They're actually using two business models, so it's kind of a hybrid app, but we're going to focus on in-app purchases for them for the moment. OkCupid okay, uses an in-house customized formula, so we're not really giving it on that slide because it includes both of those business models. However, there are certain variables or certain, let's say, factors that impact how they set the variables um, in a crucial way. First of all, they're looking at signals that show engagement. So if a user is in an active messaging thread, if he's having conversations with people in their app, that's a signal of engagement. So they would be looking at those to define engagement, retention, and churn rates. Sir, Secondly, they're also looking at various, various cohorts, right? Again, OkCupid, okay, they look, for instance, 
below 35 and above 30, uh, 35 of age because it shows that there is ma major differences between those user cohorts. They're also looking into genders and they're also looking at geographies. Lastly, they see that churn levels typically are very high, but beyond the first usage, retention gets a lot higher. So for them, a major, major, their main job is to actually get users over this first week because then that's where they get the engagement that retains them. Now, when it comes to maximizing LTV, OKCupid told us that for them, optimizing conversions for in-app purchases mainly depends on a couple of factors. First of all, they're trying to optimize creatives, messaging, calls to action in their messages on those prompts, like you see here, one of them. They're trying to customize that and do a whole lot of testing for different cohorts for different geographies, genders, ages, and so on, in order to get the best possible conversion rate. They're also trying to optimize when they put the prompt based on the context in which the user is in right now. So if you're in a conversation, or if you're in the kind of who, who visited my profile view, that's where you get the prompt, because that's a premium functionality, so they want to sell that, so that's how they put you up to the miracle who was the person who actually viewed your profile. And again, also, like, um, like Trauma Fever beforehand, they're very selective with the promotions. So they will only offer promotions, again, if they're on high impact. They typically give either limited time, 48 hour maximum, to give this kind of urgency to the user, or they do it, um, they do it with a percentage off in terms of 20% as a minimum, usually quite impactful promotions. With this kind of, with this kind of testing, okay, Cupid claimed that they've increased 20% in purchases for their, for their IPs. All right, I think I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Ads. Ads, everybody's doing it, so we figured we'd look into that. Um, now, The Guardian gave us some interesting insights here. Typically, they choose one year as a period for lifetime value calculation because they say it's a good way to find out if an, if a, if an investment has actually has an ROI on which projects they should choose uh, and which they should focus on. Lifetime is different for ads monetization because generally you're interested in user impressions because every impression on every screen gives you an opportunity to monetize that user as you know. So retention is important, but this session, like visits, sessions per visit, screens per visit, and so on, that is really, that is really the key of lifetime calculations. The Guardian has a custom, a custom formula also in-house for this, where they essentially look at those factors and they're trying to get kind of a normal distribution across all of those factors in order to determine their lifetime. They won't share that formula, but um, that's, that's how they do it. ARPU, again, that's different here because with ads, as you know, the price varies quite a lot. It's based on the sales channel, direct sales, indirect sales. The ad formats, is it a native ad, is it interstitial? It depends on the geographies, it depends on the buyers, it depends on the users you're having, so the audiences, it depends on the context of where the ads appear, and so on and so forth. So loads of different factors. Um, be aware, bring it down to one price. I mean, that goes without saying. Um, you have cost per day, cost per mile, cost per whatever. Bring it down to most commonly CPM and then get it in, feed it into your, feed it into your, um, your equation. Lifetime value period, maybe, maybe 360 days or 180 days, equals lifetime times average CPM times average number of ads per month, right? Again, that's the simple, that's a basic formula. The Guardian adapts this one. Um, segment by cohorts. So the Guardian usually takes four different cohorts for different user segments based on loyalty of those users and the number of impressions they, they, um, they cause. Also, they, cohort, they segment those cohorts into the geographies, and they're using the same lifetime value calculation for mobile web and for apps right, to compare. Right. Last model of the day, then we're done. That's also, that's by the way, the last model is also where the bike gets much more fancy. So hybrid models are arguably the most complex models in lifetime value calculation because you, co you combine, right? You combine different, different formulas. Now, many of the apps or most of the apps do that because that's how you maximize it, right? You try to have a certain variety of monetization options that you give to your user because you want to actually let the user choose what fits for him, what works for him or her. 
So here you see, for instance, um, a matrix that Vuga shared with us, popular gaming uh, developer. Now, you can see on the x-axis progression of the player in the game, and on the y-axis the spending level. Now, if a new player comes in, and he plays for a very long time, he ends up in that quadrant. That quadrant, Vuga will serve him interstitial video, interstitial apps, because that's where they get the best prices and ads monetization, because he never spent a dime on their in-app purchases. Now, on the other hand, if there is a new player coming, downloading and in installing and downloading, downloading and installing the app, and he spends a lot of money in very early stages, he will be immediately offered VIP packages, because that's where games will try to upsell and include the user further and further, right? That's an interesting model, and I think it shows very well like, which user you would want to offer which kind of monetization. Now, I'm a big fan of Ultimate Guitar Taps. We had a hangout with them. For them, they combined two business models. One, premium, and one is, is in-app purchases. Premium, lifetime value equals price. In-app purchases, they are tiering it down as well. It's interesting, actually, they told us that they're having tiers of $10, um, sorry, $9.99, $7.99, and $2.99, depending on how long the user has been, has been having the app, paid for it, downloaded it, but only using the basic version. So the longer you have it, the actually the cheaper it gets. It's interesting to remember if any of you play the guitar. Um, they claim that 40% of the users are actually upgrading within, within the app, and 65% of their revenues come from the in-app purchases. That's an interesting number. They say that 20% of their premium upgrades occur in the onboarding stage, so two hours after downloading and installing the app. They then get the VIP branding in, they give the user an insight into which content he will be able to consume after he paid for the premium segment. That increased them, their, their, their in-app purchase conversion by 53%. They again also adjust the prices per country using those indices that I mentioned before, plus 8% in downloads. And Again, store listing, it's like, a, it's like a message we're trying to hammer into your heads, but store listing experiments for them as well, critical, localizing the entire funnel makes, makes them more successful, 14% increase in downloads. All right, so theory, check, practice, check, five business models we did, that I discussed right now. There's a lot of information, right? And for me and my pals, developing this app now, um, we first have to kind of get our heads together and think a little bit what we do with that information, crunch some numbers in order to be able to choose which monetization we want to do and where we want to invest our money and which segments we want to invest our money. But I think for us and for you as well, there are three main takeaways of that presentation. First of all, lifetime value is not an end in itself. It's not a strategy. When you calculate lifetime value, be realistic. Make sure that you take into account the cost that you're actually having, variable cost. Make sure you're discounting if you have a long sales cycle. And make sure that your cost of acquisition is at a fairly decent level. Secondly, the formula. Lifetime value depends on your lifetime times your ARPU, the basis of everything. Thirdly, and that's where I have to agree with Nico, engagement is the new black. Because engagement is the metric that is much harder to optimize than ARPUs. So if you get to a high engagement and a low retention, uh, sorry, a high engagement and high retention and a low churn rate, that's where you're going to be successful. So work on that, and then you optimize for monetization. Thank you very much.